any other places. Thank you for coming. Uh, it just shows how important the exchange about food security is, the intercontinental and international exchange. My name is Muna Hasabala, and I am here on behalf of the SEZ, the Stiftung Entwicklungszusammenarbeit. It's a foundation for development cooperation, and I'm in charge of the partnership between Baden-Württemberg and Burundi. So in the following hours, we have two hours or less, in one and a half, we're going to focus on uh, the conditions and situations in Burundi. But before commencing, please let me thank all the involved um, organizations and institutions, which, uh, which are the Ministry of Rural Affairs and Customer Protection, and also the University of Burundi, Karibu, thank you for coming. Then there is also the Food Security Center, which actually is the host of this amazing Congress. Thank you for being here. And the University of Applied Forest Sciences. Thanks. And also the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung. So last but not least, I want to thank, it's a big thank you to Dr. Jenny Kopstema, thank you so much for your engagement, for your support. Without you, this session would not be here. And also on behalf of all the institutions, I would like to thank um, the, um, the ministry also to facilitate this session here. So we are grateful now to hear the welcome speech of Grit Puhan. Yes, please come here. Come to my side, please. So, Ms. Puhan is um, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Rural, uh, of, um, of Rural Affairs and Consumer Protection. And actually, there is a special relationship between the MLR, we all love abbreviations, so the MLR and the SEZ, because the MLR is, the member, is a member of the curatorship of the SEZ, and also partner of the exhibition that will, uh, will, that will be at the end of April, the Fair Handel, yeah, for Globally Responsible Trade. And it is, um, I also want to point out that it's substantially because of your support that we are all here and that we can invite also our colleagues. So I'm very glad that uh, we're going to hear the welcome speech from Ms. Puhan. Please welcome Great Puhan. Thank you. Honorable Dr. Misago, Dr. Miragira, my dear and learned professors Nkurunziza, Dr. Megale, Dr. Frank, dear Dr. Weber, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation and the friendly welcome. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to address this gathering and to thank you for your work. Everyone, I think, knows, knows African countries like Ethiopia or Kenya or Congo, as you said, but Burundi, on the other hand, is a little-known country in Africa. This makes it um, all the more important to pay attention to, the, to, to this small country in the heart of Africa facing great challenges. Burundi is one of the least developed countries in the world and ranks 184 out of 188 in the Human Development Index. With a fertility rate of almost six children per woman, the population grows by more than 3% annually. A large part of the population lives be below the poverty line. More than 50% of the population suffers from food shortages and one third of the population even depends on humanitarian aid as food production in Burundi can only meet the need for 55 days a year. And this session on Burundi is therefore intended to show how we are trying to support this in international and interdisciplinary cooperation. Fair trade and awareness raising is important. That's why our fair trade message is so important for us, as are also eight projects in the field. For this reason, the state government of Baden-Württemberg launched the state initiative Focus on Africa in autumn last year. 
The aim of this initiative is to strengthen existing cooperation between Baden-Württemberg and Africa, to expand networks and to enable investments. And Burundi is an important partner country. We want to expand our existing rooted partnership with Burundi dating back to the 1980s. For this purpose, on 16 May 2014, Minister President Kretschmann and the Minister of Foreign Relations and International Cooperation of the Republic of Burundi, uh, Laurent Kavakure, signed a partnership agreement between Baden-Württemberg and Burundi in Stuttgart. We want to help eliminate malnutrition through systematic transfer of knowledge and capacity building. We intend strengthening agricultural value chains in Burundi with the aim of securing self-sufficiency. We want to support initiatives, especially for women living in the countryside. More fair trade products from Burundi should enter the German market, not only coffee, but tea, soap, baskets, and so on. And we also want to create a network of young entrepreneurs in Burundi mediated by the SEZ, Mr. Keil. Our latest project is an agroforestry agro project in Burundi, which is accompanied by the University of Forestry in Rottenburg, Professor Megale, the DVP, Free Trade Cooperative in Ravensburg, and in cooperation with the University of Burundi. The establishment and monitoring of this agroforestry system aims at identifying ways to safeguard nutrition while preventing erosion in mountainous areas of the country and attracting farmers in Burundi to organic farming. It's about creating sustainable structures that can be continued in the country. The University of Forestry in Rottenburg and the University of Burundi have been working together since 2011. The development and expansion of this cooperation was supported in the last four years by the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung. Thank you, Dr. Weber. And later you will talk about it, I think. Subsequently, a further cooperation was discussed and the aforementioned agroforestry modal project was decided upon. Ladies and gentlemen, due to the national conditions, Burundi was once almost completely covered by different forest communities. This is, alas, long since gone. And for this reason, the model project was established. The other speakers will later tell us the details we talked about, and Professor Mekele will tell uh, the, the details. But I am convinced it will be a great agricultural, forestry, and environmental and social project, um, a great combination of all um, items. Burundi, I can say, is currently in the focus of the development policy of the state of Baden-Württemberg, and should political circumstances allow it, it is our intention to further deepen this existing partnership and help Burundi make headway. Thanks again to the initials, organizers, and speakers for their commitment. I will wish you all, as well as today's meeting, the best of luck and success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Puchan. So as our first presenter, I would like to welcome Professor Dr. Heidi E. Megale. She's a professor of applied geography and special planning at the University of Applied Forest Sciences in Rottenburg. The Uni Rottenburg is kind of like the hidden university because it is one of the smallest in Germany, but actually has a high, really high performance on research and development and has also been awarded five times as project for, of the UN Dekade as Education for Sustainable Development. We are now happy to have you here to hear about the water, food, energy nexus of the case study in Burundi. Please welcome heartily Ms. Higale. Higale. Amahoro, and thank you very much, Muna, and University of Hohenheim for this warm welcome. 
to present you here the water foot energy nexus with the case study Burundi. So uh, if you are on the Congress hidden hunger, then I think everybody knows that uh, food security is very closely linked to other conditions. That means you can only have food security if you have also water security, if you have energy security, and that's the water food energy nexus, which at this time is going to be threatened by, for example, population growth, urbanization, changing diets, etc. So if we look on the global level, today already 70% of the total water consumption is used for agriculture, and 30% of the global energy consumption is for food production and supply chain. If you want to have a food security in 2015, 50, and that's only about 30 years now, we need 60% more food production. And for this, we will need 10% more water withdrawal and 50% more energy consumption globally, which will be a very big challenge to manage. And the water food energy nexus is especially critical for development in rural areas as a lot of uh, the biggest percentage of poor people, of people suffering from hunger and malnutrition are living globally seen in a rural area. And that's also the case that unfortunately Burundi, the partner country of Baden-Württemberg, is one of the best examples for these problems and for this water, food, energy nexus. So to look at the case in Burundi, if you see, in 1962, when Burundi became independent from the ancient colonial power Belgium, Belgium had 10 million inhabitants and Burundi had 2 million. 50 years later, Belgium had 11 million, mostly due to migration, and Burundi already had 10 million inhabitants. So inhabitants has uh, fivefold is more. So of course you need a lot more food. The urbanization rate is quite small still, and 91% of uh, population is living from subsistence farming. This means that the average field areas are now around 0.5 hectare, which is of course not sufficient to nourish a whole family. I put in brackets in green, it's the numbers from Germany. So on the Global Hunger Index on 2018, the situation in Burundi was described as serious and it had the highest rate of stunting in the world. That means also uh, it's closely connected with the energy question. In Burundi, wood is the most important source of energy. You need it for cooking, as the diet includes rice, potatoes, manioc, everything has to be cooked, but you also need it for heating. At first time I came to Africa, I said heating, it's not necessary, but in fact, Burundi is a very high laying country, so you need heating also, and you need it for drying of bricks and tea. 94% of the energy consumption is by private households as they do not have much energy. And 99% of this is traditional biomass as electricity is only for about 6.5% of the population in richer parts of the cities have electricity supply. So the wood consumption is nearly three kilos per person and day, which is quite a lot. And that means that the wood consumption increased for 20% the last, let's say 30 years, and the yearly growth rate is more than 2%. That means that the potential uh, demand of wood already exceeds uh, existing forest cover by 6,000 hectares. Uh, below you see the wood for drying tea in Ishenda. In the tea is one of the most important export products. Mrs. Puchan already mentioned the problem of deforestation. Originally, 98% of Burundi would have uh, been covered by Afro-Montane mountain forest. That would have looked like here in the Kibera National for Park. Today, it looks mostly like that. That means that forest cover went down from over 90% to around 4 to 6%. And the 4 to 6% includes the eucalyptus, which were planted by World Bank programs in the 90s. Uh, so the FAO declared Burundi as world champion in deforestation. Uh, normally, today, it looks like this. So you could say that's a big problem, but the problem might be worse if you look at some new th theories that wood, forest cover, evapotranspiration, and precipitation is closely linked. So that means if you are cutting down the 
in the forests, then you have less precipitation. And I did not find anything about Burundi, but as we have the Ethiopian colleagues here, I found some literature about Ethiopia that the cutting down of the rainforests, and that Burundi is also included, will be a significant cut in precipitation in Ethiopia and in Burundi as well. So let's go to the third part of the water food energy nexus, which is water. In Burundi, you nearly have no domestic water supplies so besides the rich parts in the rich cities. So you have to look for water in wells or springs in average distance of nearly two kilometers, which means that children have to go to look for water. And only one third of the elementary school has a water supply and less than 20% adequate toilet systems. And that's the reason, if you see one of the pictures, which is from my colleague, Pascal Grun Cesar, then you do not have to do any studying to see that the water quality is not uh, according to the German regulations. Uh, that's also from Pascal and Kurun Cisa. So you see that the demand for water, normally Burundi is, has enough water, but uh, growing population leads to the problem that Burundi now is a country of uh, water economic scarcity, and they will sh shortly serve uh, severe water problems. And water and deforestation is closely linked to erosion. Here you see some landscape in Burundi where erosion starts. And if you look at the river, then you see all the sediments going to the Tanganyika Lake. And uh, here you see also from Pascal Nkurunziza one of his photos. I think this uh, school doesn't uh, exist anymore because uh, you see the erosion was taken away. Uh, that's also from Pascal, uh, some of his works on erosion in the capital city of Bujumbura. So you see the close connection of deforestation, water, erosion, declining soil fertility, and lack of agricultural fields. So to put it together, we have a vicious circle of this water food energy nexus in Burundi. That means we have a very high population growth rate, one of the highest in the world. We have a very high increase, of course, in food demand. That means that we have a growing pressure on potential farmland, and potential farmland is also the few remaining national parks and forest areas. That means we have growing deforestation rates. That means that we have a very high rate of erosion, which leads to a declining soil fertility. And it leads also to a decreasing rate of infiltration and a reduced evapotranspiration, which leads to decreasing water availability. At the same time, we have a growing impact of climate change and we have a growing rate of environmental and also other refugees. That means that we have a self-enforcing downward spiral. So that sounds extremely negative, but we are here to look for some pot possible solution strategies. And one of them could be energy efficiency. If you see a cooking place like this, and it's in a hospital, that's no private cooking place, then you see that there is a lot of potential to have more energy efficient means which would reduce the wood consumption. <laughs> or alternative energy resources like solar energy, uh, water energy, etc. Then reforestation and environmental education. Then Mrs. Puchan already mentioned agroforestry project. Fortunately, the ministry uh, awarded us the support together with my colleague, Dr. Sanctus Niagara and Professor Bernadette Habonimana, who could not be present here, to do an agroforestry project together with uh, partners from the practice and about 10,000 families growing coffee in Burundi. Then, of course, family planning, uh, poverty reduction and education will be a most important thing, which uh, Professor Misago will talk about later, and research projects and know-how transfer. That's, I think, our business. When Pascal had been here for one of the first times, he had a, a presentation at our university in Rottenburg, and there he said, it's lacking of specialists. That means Burundi needs urgent uh, trained people who could uh, give the know-how transfer at university who could do this environmental awareness. One of these persons might be Raisa Mpundu. It's our first Burundian student doing a master in uh, Tübingen and now being a PhD candidate at the University of Tübingen and the University of Burundi working on groundwater research. Um, so I gave you a short overview. We will discuss this later. And Murako Sechane. Thank you very much, Ms. Megale, for this very interesting input. 
And our next presenter is now we're shifting from Baden Wurttemberg to Burundi. So please welcome with me Dr. Alois Misago. <laughs> Mr. Misago is a long friend and partner of the SEZ. We have realized a couple of projects together and he's a lecturer and dean of the Business Institute of the University in Burundi in Bujumbura. And last week, I had the chance to be welcomed by you at your university and faculty. And uh, now it's our turn to heartily welcome Alois Misago and to hear about the socioeconomic context of food security in Burundi. Please welcome Alois Misago. Good morning. It's a pleasure to me to speak about uh, this very beautiful country known as uh, the heart of Africa. Uh, Burundi, uh, Burundi um, is situated uh, in, in the heart of Africa uh, between um, uh, Tanzania in the east, uh, Rwanda in the north, and uh, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, in the west. Uh, Burundi um, uh, could be a rich land because uh, it has uh, potentials, uh, but um, uh, we have uh, seen uh, uh, in, the, in the history uh, many problems, political instability uh, since independence, and uh, many episodes of uh, violence. And uh, the, the newest one uh, was in, 19, in 2015, uh, which has caused um, insecurity. And uh, until today, there are uh, a part of uh, refugees uh, who are living in the neighboring countries, uh, Rwanda or Tanzania. And um, uh, the politicians had started uh, with uh, talks to end the insecurity and the political problems, but um, they have stopped now. And there were uh, some tensions between Burundi and the international community. Uh, we can uh, see that in Burundi there is um, an alarming uh, state of poverty, especially in rural areas. Um, uh, compared to the other uh, countries in Africa, uh, uh, Burundi has two times higher um, food insecurity than the average of uh, the countries of sub-Saharan um, Africa. And uh, we have about 1.76 million people who are uh, food insecure. Uh, the agriculture um, sector employs 80% of the population, but uh, contributes to only 40% um, to the DGP. Um, uh, we have also uh, a very low access to water and electricity, less than 5% uh, of the population, uh, but it is um, inequally um, distributed in the town. Uh, we have uh, about 32% uh, and in the rural area, about 2%. Uh, and the population is growing um, very uh, quickly. At the independence, we had uh, uh, less than 3 million people. And um, uh, in two, uh, 2010, we had already um, more than 10 million people. Today, uh, we have uh, about 12 million um, uh, population in Burundi. And uh, Burundi is uh, the most densely populated African country with uh, uh, 470 uh, inhabitants per square kilometer. And um, the economy of Burundi is largely dependent uh, of agriculture. 80% uh, of the population in the agriculture sector and um, uh, the Arab arable land is very, very limited. And there are um, uh, many conflicts related to uh, land use and land property. 
Uh, since 2017, two years ago, we have uh, uh, some recovery from uh, the crisis of 2015, but Burundi remains the poor house of the, uh, the East African uh, community. Now uh, to the um, uh, poverty profile. Um, 2015, 14, uh, 64 uh, percent of the population uh, were under the um, poverty line, and um, compared to uh, 2006, there is some progress. Uh, but still now, two-thirds of all Burundians uh, can't cover their daily basic food and non-food needs, and. Um, and the 25% uh, uh, of the population live under uh, the, the line, uh, the poverty uh, line. And it is different from province to province. Uh, the eastern provinces are more affected by the uh, monetary and non-monetary poverty, and the western um, are uh, uh, less poor than the eastern uh, ones. At a national level, 64% uh, are living under um, a poverty line, and uh, in the rural area, there are more than 71%. Uh, uh, the urban areas are more rich than uh, the um, rural ones. There is a clear relationship between uh, um, monetary poverty and malnutrition because uh, the ones who don't have money uh, can't afford to, uh, to, to, to buy uh, food. Uh, we have uh, about 44.4% uh, people who were the poorest in the country uh, and uh, those who, who uh, uh, called the hardcore of poor poverty and um, uh, about 34.7% uh, of households uh, are more vulnerable to various shocks, economic, ecological, and health, and they can uh, easily switch to um, uh, the absolute uh, poverty. Um, the non-poor in any of the two dimensions are uh, about 20.9%, uh, and those uh, uh, live mostly in towns, uh, of course, in Bujumbura. Uh, we can see that uh, there is a greater poverty um, in rural area, 2.5 times more poor uh, people uh, than in urban areas. And um, uh, uh, with regards to uh, non-monetary uh, poverty, um, the rural pe uh, population uh, uh, are 11 times more poor than the urban ones. Uh, we can also see that um, uh, the heads of how, how, households uh, in the uh, 35 uh, to uh, 54 age group um, are more poor. They are the poorest because they have a lot of charges with ch children going to school and so on. And another um, um, situation that uh, individuals living in female-headed households uh, are less poor. Uh, for Burundians, it, it is not surprising because we know that uh, men uh, mostly spend their money by drinking beer. Uh, there is um, uh, uh, less uh, poverty uh, by households whose head uh, has no education uh, level, uh, uh, and um, the poverty is much higher by this um, uh, population. And the house, households whose head has uh, um, at least a high school education and above are less uh, um, poor. Uh, the households uh, whose head is occupied in the primary sector, uh, agriculture, uh, fishing, and uh, library, uh, livestock are more poor than the ones uh, who work in uh, 
um, in trade or uh, service sectors. Uh, which strategy uh, could be applied to Burundi in order to end poverty and uh, hunger? Uh, there is a study um, uh, presented uh, last year, 2018, uh, in order to, uh, to help uh, the Office for uh, Communal Investment and the, this, uh, these strategies, uh, the first one is capacity building uh, by training um, in order uh, to make the, uh, the, the, the uh, farmers um, get uh, techniques uh, and uh, to introduce uh, adequate technology, use of local knowledge and improving financial capacities uh, in order to make the, um, the agriculture and the livestock uh, sector a business um, uh, for the people. Because if you go to Burundi and you ask, you ask a farmer uh, if he has something to do, he will mostly um, uh, answer, I have nothing to do. Because they think that um, um, uh, agriculture and um, animal husbandry is an activity uh, for, for someone who doesn't have anything else to do. Another strategy is um, to improve the partnership for development. Um, the partnership between uh, the farmers themselves um, uh, with um, building cooperatives, uh, the partnership with uh, universities and research uh, institutes uh, for innovation. Uh, we have uh, at the University of Burundi uh, for the first time this year organized uh, an um, academia, uh, public, uh, private partnership in order to ease the transfer of knowledge and technology from the university to the community and also encourage um, the private sector to invest in agriculture and livestock. Um, the partnership uh, um, would be extended to um, foreign universities like Hohenheim, and we have already uh, partnerships with um, the University of Tübingen and uh, the Fachhochschule Rottenburg. <laughs> and um, I think um, there may be um, uh, some uh, coordination between different organizations at national and uh, international level. And um, uh, there is also a need of processing the, um, uh, the products, uh, agricultural uh, products and conservation of those products and also to make a market assessment. And uh, here uh, to this market assessment belongs also the fair, fair trade, which is um, regularly organized here in um, um, Stuttgart. So to conclude uh, uh, this presentation, I think Burundi um, faces a difficult uh, situation, but not uh, necessarily a, a desperate one because um, uh, there are um, a lot of potentials uh, and if we, if we can um, uh, build capacities uh, for uh, in university, at the university level, uh, the knowledge will be transferred to the community and also uh, the um, technologies. And um, uh, we have to encourage the invest investments and the cooperation. Um, and we have now uh, from the Burundi government um, a plan, a strategic, a strategic plan to, uh, to end poverty and, um, and um, malnutrition uh, from uh, 2018 to uh, 2027. And they have defined a roadmap for this action. And we can hope that um, uh, in the next future, Burundi will no longer suffer from hunger and poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it is obvious uh, that Burundi is very rich in a lot of different aspects. And uh, still there is one aspect that uh, was mentioned, the, uh, that the rural area has a lot of challenges. And uh, our next presenter 
which is Dr. Sanctus Niragira, is uh, here. There he's coming. <laughs> he will um, he will tell us more about the smallholder farmers and the challenges that they face. Um, Dr. Niragira is from the Department of Rural Development, the Faculty of Agronomy and Bioengineering at the University of Burundi. And um, yeah, I'm really interested now to hear how the smallholder farmers can cope with the, with the fact that the agricultural input and output is hardly predictable. So I'm very happy that he's here now. Please heartily welcome him, Dr. Sanctus Niragira. Okay, thank you. Very <laughs> thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, for me as well to have a talk about this beautiful country, as he mentioned, he mentioned my professor. I will focus on farming system in this country and its implication on household living standard. The title is here, Farm Household Vulnerability and Food Security Challenge in Burundi. Okay, this is the outline of uh, my presentation. I will first give a brief introduction. This will be followed by the major challenges in agricultural production of Burundi. And I will talk about the agricultural practices and food security in Burundi. And not, I will not uh, limit the presentation on the, the existing facts. I will also try to give an empirical study, study that focused on finding alternative, alternative solution to that problem. And I will end the presentation with a brief conclusion and policy implication. Uh, this study departed from the current concern on how to feed sustainably the growing population worldwide. Uh, it is projected that the population, the world population will reach 9 billion in, two, in 2050. And then researchers highlighted that there is a need of 70 to 100 percent increase in food production. Despite all the effort, according to FIO 2014 estimate, the uh, eight 105 million people are still chronically hungry in the, in the world. And paradoxically, is that uh, food insecurity households are living in a rural area where food is being produced. As you can see this on this map, the country that I am talking about is Burundi. The red color here uh, show countries where the food insecurity, the rate of food insecurity is very high. The main challenge for these, these areas is how to increase production using the same quantity and the, and the quality of production factors when taking into, into account the prevailing conditions. The study area is here. They have already said much about it. What I would say is that the, the, the the economy of this country relies on agriculture for, for labor force, food supply, and also in economic contribution. It contributes almost uh, about 40% in the gross domestic product. It's a country with a good agroecological environment with eight months of rain season, allowing three cropping season. Uh, we, when you look at the landscape and also the agroecological zones, this country, the situation would allow a wide range of agricultural produce. But we have a problem of demography, land scarcity, and food, food insecurity and poverty in this country. The major challenges here are the demographic pressure. I have, they have already said something about it. This implies the land overexploitation and also degradation. This had brought farmers to focus mostly on less demanding food, but less poor in nutrients. 
There is a problem of market failure for both input and out output, and also insurance, insurance for farmers. The high dependency on rain-fed agriculture is also a challenge because of this climate change where farmers are obliged to follow the, 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 the patterns in rainfall. There is household poverty which caused the low investment in agriculture. The implication of all of this is the low factor productivity and low pro purchasing power of the farmers. Uh, for the empirical study, we have three uh, research questions. What are the current agricultural practice and impact on factor productivity and household welfare? The second question is, are there uh, possible techniques that can be used to improve this situation? And the last question is, what are the necessary conditions for the, to succeed in, with these optimal farming systems? As uh, a methodology, we uh, did literature review, household service, then the statistical analysis, the data environment analysis, the typology, and we also built a farm level mathematical programming model to look for to see if we can find an alternative solution to this. Here I explain what the, the, the farm level mathematical programming here tries to capture all the aspects of uh, the, 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 the farming system in Burundi, mainly the subsistence ori oriented uh, farming system. That implies that farm household production factors, they, they have to use the production factor at hand, the household food and the nutrition need, and the consumption because they want to minimize the dependence on the market because the market is failing. And also they want to cope with risk. Here are the results. I prefer to show the result using pictures. As you can see, the first picture uh, left, it shows the typical subsistence oriented agricultural system in our countries. There is a mix of more than five crops on the same plot. If we look at the picture, uh, why do they mix crops? They mix crops for two reasons. The first reason is that they want to minimize the dependency to the market because the market is failing. They want to grow everything they would need to avoid going to the market and have problem with their low purchasing power. Uh, second, they, if uh, they want to make kind of insurance, security reasons, because if any crop fail, fails, they will still rely on the remaining crops. That's why they do, they do that like this. Uh, to the right hand, you will see the, this land, the land fragmentation and degradation. And at the bottom, you see the livestock and also the post-harvest techniques. This is uh, to show the trend in agricultural production. You have already seen the trend in the population increase in Burundi. It was, uh, we considered the period of from 60s to 2015. If you look at the evolution in a major food, food crop here, you see that the trend in increase is not correlated, positively correlated with the population growth. I didn't plot the population growth here, but you have already seen that. And another concern here is that there is an, uh, a trend in increasing the uh, food, the banana, tuba, and the root, and a decrease in oil seed, oil seed, pearls, and cereals. Also for livestock, there is a decrease in the cattle, but with an increase which is not really significant in goat, small animals. Here we looked at farm practice efficiency and household welfare. As you can see, here we, the, the land size, 
the farm size is less than one hectare and the contribution of agriculture to the livelihood, household livelihood is 70%. And also there is a room for improvement if we look at efficiency score. It's, uh, the, the efficiency is evaluated, is computed at almost 50%. Then there are 50% to be improved. As a summary to this, there is an acute land scarcity. Small farms are more efficient, but they are very small to make a living, and there is a concern about the future of these small farms. There is, more, there is an increase in a, a high density, a high energy density crop with less nutritious value. And there is a very low meat and animal-based food, uh, food consumption. There is an investment, uh, low investment in fruit and vegetable. Uh, here we didn't plot the fruit and the vegetable because the, they are produced at, uh, with small, quant in small quantities. Here the optimum farm planning. Here I just highlighted the crops that was generated by the model, but the model give the output of what you enter the input. These are the crops, we entered the crops, and we tried to, to consider the, the, um, the, the, nutri the nutrition consideration of the, the, the population. I will explain maybe this here. If you look at this, this figure, the red color indicates the current practice, the blue one indicates the optimum practice, and the, uh, the green one indicates the farm practice with risk considered. You see the change in a, a number of crops at the optimum point. It indicates that farmers should go for a limited number of crops in order to improve the food security and also the economic situation of the household. The conclusion to this is that risk aversion is the main driver of mixed cropping system in agricultural system of the country. We looked at the economic side, the farm gross margin, income in US dollars. You, you see that the current, the, from the current practice to the risk-free uh, model, they can improve, they can double the production. But when the risk is considered, is taken into account in the model, you see also an improve, an improvement, but the, 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 the increase is somehow not very high, but still they can improve while considering the, uh, the prevailing conditions. Here, the, the, the summary of this, the, 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 of this is that optimization implies the reduction in, in, in crop, in the number of crop. There is an increase of farm output and the specialization, if they grow a limited number of crop, they can, they can force the trade. They can trade between themselves and improve the access to the market. The, there is higher shade of, shade of prices of production factor with the, 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 these models, optimization models. We noticed an increased opportunity cost of labor, an increased land returns, and increased return to investment. Let's have a look at the, the nutritional side. Here we considered the last model with risk bounded, with, uh, which takes into account the risk. We uh, classified this farm into four categories, large farm, medium farm, small farm, and the land race. And we considered the food shortages, the shortage in food macronutrient. Macro we considered calorie, protein, and fat. When looking at the annual consumption, actually with the three cropping season, uh, this implies seasonality. Here we consider the annual consumption. We assume that food that is produced can be, uh, can be used 
uh, all the year around, which is not true indeed. Then we added the seasonality to reflect the real situation on the ground. We consider that food that is produced in season, season one, season D, season two, season three, will be consumed within the same season. Then if you look at this, this result, you see that there is increase in food shortages for the, uh, the, the real situation, the seasonality in consumption. And when you apply the, the, the storage system, you see that there is a decrease. The yearly consumption will highlight, highlight the 6% shortage. When we consider the seasonality, it's only, it's, it increases to 18%. And by applying the storage, storage system, it decreases to, it decreases to 10% shortage, shortage in the main food nutrient, macro, the main food nutrient. As a conclusion and policy implication, the risk perception is an important driving force to adopt multiple cropping. The trend in farming system affects negatively the diet toward high dense energy, but poor in protein, fat, and other micro, uh, micronutrients. What we recommend here is the nutrition sensitive agriculture, optimum crop choice, and food fortification to improve the quality of the, of the, pro, the, pro, the food produced, and also to go for, uh, to improve the infrastructure for storage system in order to prevent the post-harvest losses. The improved market infrastructure will increase household living, increase marketable, marketable surplus, and stimulate investment in agricultural production, and also will increase labor opportunity for poor farmers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Niragira. So <clears throat> we're gonna use all of the information that you heard now for the, also for the panel discussion. Um, so, but before we go, I think uh, we're going to introduce the panelists uh, first. So, um, three of the panelists you already know. It's uh, Grit Puhan, then there is uh, Heidi Imegale, and also uh, Alois Misago. And there are three more panelists that I would like to introduce uh, in detail. But first, let me say a heartily welcome to the State Ministry. Uh, I see Ms. Niedmann here. So thank you very much, Ms. Niedmann. And State Ministry is very important for our work and uh, is also a substantially sponsor for us. So the other three um, panelists, I'm going to start with Pascal Nukurunziza. Pascal? Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can, you can come forward, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pascal Nukurunziza is an associate professor and teacher at the Department of Earth Sciences of the University in Burundi. And uh, yeah, in the past, he also held <laughs> um, political positions. So I'm very happy that, that he's also here. In addition, please welcome also Professor Dr. Jan Frank. If you may join the panel discussion table. <laughs> Mr. Frank is the Vice Director of the Food Security Center and also Professor of Food Biofunctionality at the University of Rottenburg. And I just call him the godfather of this Hidden Hunger Congress because he is the initiator also for this uh, Congress here. Um, maybe also one word to the Food Security Center it's an excellent center for um, ex exchange and development and also to educate international young scientists. And by doing so, they're actually supporting the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, number one and two, which are zero hunger and no poverty. So welcome also, Professor Frank. And please also welcome the third 
a new panelist for you, who is Dr. Andreas Weber. Please also join the, the discussion table um, from the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung. I'm not going to translate Baden-Württemberg. I think there is no translation for that. So it's a Baden-Württemberg Stiftung. And the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung was also involved in the Burundi project of the University of Rottenburg slash also Tübingen and the University of Burundi. So this is where the circle closes. And now please also come Ms. Grit Puchan, Ms. Megale, and please always Ms. Hago. Have a seat. Yeah, so um, the topic of our oh, are you on? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's on. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. The topic of our discussion uh, will be um, Burundi Baden Württemberg Burundi Baden Württemberg partnership. Facing the challenge of food and nutrition security. Yeah. Thank you. So again, it's uh, about the Burundi and Baden-Württemberg uh, partnership and facing the challenge of food and nutrition security. So we have six experts sitting here. We have half an hour and I hope that we have also some time to get some of the questions from the audience. So I'm just going to start on how we can face the challenge and how the partnership can actually help us. So Ms. Puchan, may I ask you, what are the expectations from the MLR with regard to the partnership um, when it comes to higher education institutions between Baden-Württemberg and Burundi? So how do you profit? How do you benefit from that partnership? Um, oh, it's not, not so easy to answer <laughs> to your question. Um, the uh, cooperation on governmental level is not so easy, uh, I may say, uh, between Baden-Württemberg and the state of Burundi. And so um, uh, we support non-governmental initiatives um, with the, uh, for example, uh, the University of uh, Tübingen or Rottenburg and the University of Burundi and uh, other corporations um, which are mediated by the SEZ. Um, this is um, our, um, and with these cooperations, we want uh, we want to help uh, eliminate malnutrition and um, to strengthen the agricultural value chain and uh, to support initiatives, especially for women. Uh, as you have heard, um, women are more reliable, and <laughs> and the, the the income is more is higher uh, if the households are. Are, uh, leaded by women and that's why we want to um, support women initiatives and um, we want uh, to have more fair products um, uh, fair trade products uh, from Burundi in Baden-Württemberg because these products are very good they are from a high quality and um, but uh, they they and we would be very glad if we would see more products in our shops and um, uh, in April on the fair trade messe. And at the end, we will be very glad if um, we could uh, deepen the partnership, this partnership, and um, if, we, if we could help Burundi because the challenges are very, very high, as you all have heard today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So you're stressing basically also the, the exchange between the institutions which is my, and, and also the SDG number five, which is one of my favorites, the gender <laughs> equality and um, strengthening the partnership as well. Um, uh, Mr. Weber, I know that your Stiftung has a lot of experiences with um, international relationships and partnerships. So um, 
what can you tell us some like best practices in terms of education as you are also the um, head of education department um, can you tell us some best practices what were your learnings about those international partnerships that you had okay yes of course thank you for the question let me put it in a more general context as one of the Germany's most <clears throat> influential foundations. One of our core commitments is to contribute to intercultural dialogue and so also to capacity buildings. The aspects of international responsibility and international understanding play a major role in our daily work. So, therefore, we support the international exchange of young people, university st uh, students, as well as young professionals with the Baden-Württemberg Stipendium, the Baden-Württemberg Scholarship, one of the largest scholarships in uh, Germany. Our aim is to create a global network with the intention to include all regions of the world. And to pursue this aim intensively, the supervisory board of the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung decided to add one million euro to the Baden-Württemberg Stipendium in 200, uh, 2017 in accordance with the development policy guidelines of the state of Baden-Württemberg these additional financial means should be for the benefit of young people studying at universities in ACP states or LDCs who would like to spend one or two semesters abroad at the uni at a university in Baden-Württemberg with these financial means we hope to be able to strengthen the exchange, especially with Af African countries, including, of course, Burundi, as these are still weakly represented in the Baden-Württemberg Stipendium. <clears throat> Last year, more than 200 <coughs> stipends came from Africa to Baden-Württemberg, many of them PhD students researching on current topics and challenges, challenges their countries are facing as a for example, tropical diseases, agriculture, and hunger. To push these relationships <coughs> further, we are currently developing a program line that fo focuses on capacity building. There will be opportunities for staff from African universities and universities in Baden-Württemberg to learn from each other and to further intensify contacts and improve existing structures. And we heard in the presentations how important that point is. However, we do not focus only focus on supporting individuals. With the Baden-Württemberg Stipendium for University Students, BWS Plus, the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung supports innovative cooperation projects between universities in Baden-Württemberg and foreign ones, especially within the last two years, we received an increasing number of applications from universities in Baden-Württemberg who would like to start a project in cooperation with African universities. These are often projects dealing with current challenges in these countries, such as access to clean water, proper sanitation, healthcare, forestry, and vaccination. One example of uh, that project is conducted by the University of Applied Sciences <laughs> Rottenburg and the Université du Burundi in Bujumbura. Students of, and we heard of that project, mm -hmm. and we will hear, hear more uh, now uh, later on from Professor Megale and students of forestry, resource management, water susta and sustainable regional management of Rottenburg University of Applied Sciences, as well as Chemistry and Earth Sciences in Tübingen, can spend a semester abroad at the University du Burundi or write their thesis in Burundi while they are integrated into interesting, challenging, and socially relevant projects in Burundi. Students from Burundi can complete their education in international environment and acquire no knowledge that is urgently needed in their home country. And as I said, then the Professor Nuko Risa, Professor Megale, and Professor uh, Misaki uh, got into more detail. We think get connect, uh, connected and get involved and educated through international exchange is, in our view, one important element in the cooperation with Burundi mm -hmm. and uh, we
had it in the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the profound answer of, uh, of this question. And um, staying in this uh, university field, um, may I pass? Do you have a microphone there? Oh, yeah, perfect. May I uh, ask you, um, Mr. Frank, um, you're the vice director of the Food Security Center. And um, what, is, what is the approach that the Food Security Center has when talking about uh, food security? I know you have international partnerships. Which role does this network also play in your work? Well, before going to answer this question, I'll actually uh, have to interject something small. Okay. I know you called me the godfather of the Congress, and I think you're referring to the mob kind of thing, the guy who handles the finances in the background, when you're right. <laughs> but of course, the father of the Congress and the heart and the brain is Professor Wiesalski. Okay, good. Sure okay, so have... <laughs> thank you. So, it's true, all the bills pass through my office. So. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, the mafiosi behind it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the question is, of course, an interesting one. I mean, what does the Food Security Center do to... Um, improve food security around the world and um, well the the major tool by which we do that is actually by improving training and education making sure we heard a lot about um, household incomes education being major drivers of food insecurity and we need to increase um, basically on the human capital in affected countries around the world and this is basically where the food security center starts by training the future generation of scientists by making sure that there's a network of scientists um, around the globe actually also to um, tackling certain topics on a scientific and um, interest driven basis but of course also by making sure that teachers from our universities here go to countries so we have north south exchange well we also do have a lot of south south exchange so the actual um, researchers in those countries exchange and, and um, deal with the topics and have research projects. And um, of course we have um, 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 funding possibilities, so we are able to actually have <laughs> PhD students, we have postdocs, we even um, can host visiting professors and make sure that there's uh, money to go around for them to actually be trained and educated. We send people from our university to give courses there to support conferences like this conference, for example. There's a lot of um, these kind of activities that you can do to make sure that there's an improved um, scientific basis which will increase the capacities at the universities and then make sure that the next generation of scientists um, also stays there and has an environment to actually work in because that's one thing if we invite people here to do their PhD training um, and they see what's possible here and then see the limited possibilities back home they may be attracted to not going back and I think one of the important things that we need to make sure is that we have tools um, which improve the situation um, at the countries and we have one very good example of that the um, it's a graduate school that we have called Climate Change Effects on Food Security, short CLI food, where we actually do exactly that. So we have um, secured funding for up to 14 um, long-term scholarships. We have training sessions that are um, in Ethiopia. We have training sessions here. So there's a lot of exchange and it's also on a scientific basis. So there's actually researchers from Hohenheim and from Havasa University in Ethiopia involved. They actually, they tackle a scientific problem together. They get interested, they engage in each other's um, exchange. And by that, we make sure that there's actually training in Ethiopia. The PhD students there will also stay and contribute to then training the next generation of scientists there. Yeah. Wow, I'm kind of overwhelmed by all these <laughs> uh, activities and uh, all these wonderful ideas. And um, uh, so, so this is everything that the Food Security Center does from, from here. And um, let's switch to, to, to Burundi. Um, may, maybe Mr. Misago, um, when I was at your university last week, I could see how thrilled and engaged you also are to fight solutions for the challenges that exist. So how could the partnership between Baden-Württemberg and uh, Burundi in the higher education institutions, how, how could you benefit as a University of Burundi from this? 
thank you. We have already started to benefit from um, that partnership because uh, the most problem we have at the University of Burundi is, is the lack of qualified teachers. Uh, for example, in my institute, um, I, I, we have um, almost 2,000 students, um, <laughs> but um, we have only 22 full-time professors. Um, the, the other 65 are part-time uh, professors. So uh, we need uh, very urgently to have uh, uh, some uh, new professors, and uh, the partnership would help uh, to, to increase um, the um, uh, human resources at the University of Burundi. And uh, the talks we had um, the, during this um, um, Congress uh, give us hope that um, uh, we, we would um, um, increase those human resources uh, in cooperation with uh, the University of Hohenheim uh, with regards to, um, uh, to uh, um, um, uh, the Faculty of uh, uh, Agriculture and Bioengineering, uh, which has uh, here uh, three repre representatives. And uh, uh, also the other faculties have um, uh, need urgently um, uh, professors. So I, I think um, there is also a need of networking um, um, of the universities of Baden-Württemberg uh, but also networking of our universities in Africa. I was very happy to meet our colleagues from, uh, from Ethiopia because they are farther than uh, uh, we are in Burundi. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the, it's, it's all about exchanging and uh, bringing north and south and south and south and everyone just together on a table. But um, so the subline of the topic is uh, is facing the challenge of food security, and uh, it's not that oh okay there is uh, there is food insecurity we have this 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 solution and that's it. So this singular just point of view or approach to the as to this topic is not enough. So um, Mr. Nukurunziza, I know that you have you you you're an expert on 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 food security and and also on other aspects. Um, what do you think, what, uh, which other aspects are affected when we face this challenge, uh, actually, with, with this partnership? Um, food security, it is a thing, uh, but uh, I think there is uh, more things which affected the food security. There are sometimes political, aspects as good governance, but it can be how to manage all um, the, the products. Uh, for example, in my uh, qualification as a geologist, I know that in Burundi, we have uh, many, many mining, we have uh, gold, we have Colombo tantalite, we have uh, Wolframite, Nickel, all those things can contribute to combat the, uh, the hunger. It is not only um, agriculture, but all parameters have to converge to, to combat this hunger. And um, I'm very happy that to be here uh, because uh, what we have experienced in this cooperation, it is a very good thing for us. Um, maybe if uh, you permit me to, to continue on this, um, we have had uh, a good um, experience in the cooperation on the academic level. We have had exchange from professors from different branches, chemistry, uh, agropastoral, uh, agroforestry, geologists, and, every, and the others. And if all those research they do, 
they can converge to to combat the hunger. It's so it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're also going for the more holistic approach rather than just yes. focusing on that. Okay. And um, uh, last but not least, also <laughs> I want to hear uh, from from Miss Megale because I know that you have uh, you you were telling us about the project that you did with uh, um, the University of, of Burundi, and um, how did you personally or also your your university um, profit from this uh, from this partnership? Um, also in terms of uh, combating the the challenge. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question which always arises if you're doing such uh, international corporations. What are the profits which come out on the one side and on the other side? And I must say, uh, looking back at nearly one decade now working together with Burundi and also other international corporations that our university, our students and also my I personally, we profited a lot. We got a lot out of these projects and got a lot back. Uh, it's not that these international projects are one-way road or a development aid, like you called it in former times, but in fact, it's a two-direction uh, road and it's a development cooperation. It's really cooperation, which means, for example, we as a University of Applied Sciences, we try <laughs> to train our students to work in applied projects afterwards, often in international framework. But even if you make a wonderful present PowerPoint presentation with a lot of uh, pictures and telling them about how the challenges are in some other countries and working on an international level that will be never the same as being in uh, contact with uh, these um, people from these countries. And for example, when Pascal Nkurunziza, who is fluent in German, uh, came to our university several times, I included him in my seminaries. So it's totally different if I am telling about problems in Burundi and challenges and uh, positive solution strategies, or if my students can discuss with somebody like Pascal Nkurunziza. And also if the students, uh, like you already pointed out, Dr. Weber, uh, financed by Baden-Württemberg Foundation, have the possibility also in both directions to work together in tandem teams for, for example, their thesis and to see how uh, the real challenges are and uh, learn from each other. And also we have a uh, networking. If I would not have known the Burundian colleagues, then probably I would have never got into contact with the Food Security Center in the University of Hohenheim, and I would not have known the colleagues coming from Havasa University in Ethiopia. And now, uh, yesterday, we talked and we are trying to do a trilateral, triangle uh, project with North-South-South cooperation, which offers a lot of new possibilities. And then last but not least, I think there's no better way to check your images, your cliches, and perhaps also your prejudices as coming into contact with real persons in real countries and real challenges. And that's also the case for both sides. And there, I think we took a lot of profit out from these international corporations. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I see we still have a little bit of time, so I want to open the space for the audience. If you have questions that you would like to, ans uh, to ask, then raise hands, maybe. Oh, there's some. Okay. So one here and then up there. <coughs> I'm Julian May from the Center of Excellence in Food Security in South Africa. So I was really excited when I saw this panel presented because Burundi is one of my favorite countries in Africa. And before I read the brochure more carefully, I thought I might finally get to meet the avocado president. So to clarify that, there was a time when the, the current president of, of Burundi was promoting the, the, the growth of avocado trees. And a student of myself, a Burundian student of myself, looked at this and found, a, after controlling for all the appropriate things, a positive link between child food security and access to avocado. It hasn't been mentioned at all, and I was interested to, and I would like some comment on that, particularly given the involvement of a, of a center of applied forestry. 
um, and I would think that avocado would be a very pop popular import into Baden-Württemberg. So is there still potential in avocado in Burundi? And are the measures being taken to try and encourage the cultivation of such tree, um, fruit tree crops in Burundi? I do not know if that's possible to uh, enlarge the panel discussion, but I would like my colleague, Sanctus Niragira, who is a specialist in agriculture, perhaps he could uh, the be give the best answers to the avocado question. Sanctus, is it possible that you c could come here and give an answer? Thank you very much, and thank you also for the, this question. Uh, actually, the current president promoted the cultivation of avocado since 2005, and indeed the, the consumption of avocado has increased in the country. And even if you look at the neighboring countries, avocado is being sold in the neighboring countries, but how much, how, how many tons, it's very difficult to, 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 to say. And also, uh, you have a concern that we didn't mention it anywhere in our presentation. Avocado, it was promoted from 2005, and like the trend in the production that I was showing here are taken from the FAO website from the 1960s to 2015 and avocado is not at the website to be able to 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 plot the the the, 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 the evolution in avocado uh, production and with regard to the trade of avocado with the within this cooperation i think someone else can complete <laughs> thank you Thank you. Does anyone want to talk about avocado trading? Uh, 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 yeah, but there was another question. Yeah, um, up there, the woman up there. We need to. Oh, there's also. Okay, after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to the presenters for the very interesting and enlightening presentation. But what I want to say is that I'm worried. I'm worried and at the same time I'm amazed and it's not only because of Burundi but I'm worried about um, how we get the decision makers to use the information that is available. There's a lot of information we have gained this whole week, very interesting presentations, factual, but how do we get decision makers to make decisions based on this information? I think that's my worry especially when uh, Alois uh, presented all those very grim statistics about poverty in Burundi. And I believe many of us in developing countries, we can identify with this. But I think we need to go further and develop platforms where this information can be disseminated to people who make decisions about the populations in these countries. I think we have a reason to worry about this. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alice, you, you want to comment? Um, <coughs> uh, sorry. I, I've already, uh, also uh, shown that we are, uh, we are now um, uh, trying to uh, bring together all stakeholders um, uh, in the so-called academia public-private partnership and we wanted to, to create an interface in order to, to make the information um, available, to make the, the results of research um, available for uh, the community. Uh, that is a new approach, but I think we will go further. And um, um, you are right, um, the, sometimes uh, the decision makers are not uh, really informed of the uh, the, the, the scientific um, results. Thank you. There's a next question. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Lina Sanga from the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. 
Um, from the presentations that we had, I heard about one of the strategies, which is to uh, enhance the access to credit for the poor. So I just wanted to learn uh, from you to say, how is this working? Looking at, at the fact that many of those uh, people that are getting access to these loans are poor and uh, they are also in need of food. How is this working? And again, I haven't heard anything to do with behavior change communication strategies that are being used as you're doing the programs. Because to me, I think some of these things are culturally embedded and would really need uh, to promote um, behavior change as strategies. Uh, but there was also a, a, a question. I think so, um, or maybe it's a comment uh, that the the communication is is missing, and and uh, and also behavioral and mentality change. Is that what you what what you were saying? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, it, did you want to? Yeah. Did you answer it? Yeah. Maybe maybe you or Mr. Nokurunzida. I think that is a, a very important point because uh, I think uh, development matters are not only um, related to money. It is uh, a matter of, of changing the mentality of the people. Um, and um, uh, that is a point which is not uh, really uh, considered uh, very often in develop the development discussions, but it is, it is true. Uh, the people have to change um, the mentality. And um, as it is now, uh, uh, people have already uh, understood that the development will not come from outside. They have to, to do something themselves. You know, we have uh, a lot of money uh, which ca came from the West and to our countries. But if you see, uh, you, you look at the impact, it is very low because the population didn't participate in this, um, in this um, development. They didn't participate in the conception of uh, the, the, the development um, uh, matters. So uh, I think it is a very important point. Um, and uh, in our country, uh, we are um, aware that without changing mentality of the people, without changing the culture, it, uh, the development is not uh, possible. Thank you very much. So we had a question from here, from here, maybe, is there a question from there as well? Oh, there's one over there, okay. Trying to equally let okay. people, uh, from, from the other sector, yeah. So everyone is... Not me. After. <laughs> Maybe if we have time. Uh, thank you very much. I'm not going to ask, actually. I wanted to comment and to appreciate this movement to connect north, south, and south, south, which is really very important. Uh, I studied in Denmark. When I go back to Ethiopia, I felt so frustrated at the beginning. So it's good to have uh, local experiences like how Clifewood is working or we also had experience working with the University of Gießen, uh, Elephants Project with Ulm University, Jomo Kenyatta, Kenyatta, Makarari and the like. So please, I really applaud the comment given by Professor Frank. I really feel it at our University. We have 16 PhD students there. Bringing few students here still does not meet the capacity need of highly growing population and a lot of opportunities are there, especially in relation to market. And I also invite small and medium enterprises in Europe to come and work with us. We see a lot of hands coming from Asia and the like, but not that much from Europe or from America and the like. This is especially in relation to education. Uh, like, I don't want to be biased, but we really need to see many hands computing and we need to go through quality and uh, like uh, helping each other meet our needs. I know many young scholars from Germany also want to work in Ethiopia. They want to see. I, I did talk to many of them. They need to get the experience and the joint learning is a lot. So I'm not asking. It's just a question. It's okay. a comment. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you very much for your comment. And uh, I know it's, 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 it's crazy to talk about this subject uh, and just have 30 minutes. It's just an insane idea. That, uh, so f please feel free to make a picture of the contact details that, you've, that you find here. You have all the panelists and their contact details there. So please feel free also to contact the Food Security Center if you want to um, uh, in, like include yourself to the partnership. You, you and your expertise are more than welcome. So, um, yeah. Um, and I also thank uh, the, the panelists and everyone who actually made this venue happen as it was. And um, I also want to add something to the last comment that we heard, because um, as the Dalai Lama actually said, if we want to make a positive action, I think first we have, a, we have to have a positive vision. And I think this discussion made a like, first step and all the, also the actions that will be taking place to get more together, to bring North and South together, not only technology-wise, not only by digitalization, but also personally, so we connect each other. So in this spirit, I have to hand over the chair to Professor Frank, because he will reward now the best poster award, which is the next point of the program. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you for joining the Burundi panel. And I really hope to let this vivid discussion, I've seen a lot of questions. Just go, we have a lunch now, chat together, talk to us, feel free. Thank you.